Hey, I'm Lexi, and this is What You Should Know. I felt after how heavy the last three episodes have honestly been, I should probably lighten things up just a scooch. So this is what you should know about the theory surrounding Harold Holt's disappearance. But let's start with who he was. Born in 1908, Harold was not only the first Australian Prime Minister born in the 20th century, but also the first to be born in Australia. For those wondering, the first Prime Minister was appointed in 1901, but was founded in 1788 as a penal colony. In January of 1966, Harold became Prime Minister after Robert Menzies retired, and no one in his same party ran to oppose him. Later that year, when the federal election took place, Harold won in a landslide. While he was in power, he continued to dismantle the White Australia policy and amended the Constitution to make Indigenous affairs the responsibility of the government. This was wildly progressive at the time, as the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities were only given the right to vote in 1962, and it wasn't until 1973 when this White Australia policy would be completely defunct. Unfortunately, just like everywhere else on this planet, we do have a history steeped in some very horrific racism. Harold cultivated a greater engagement with Asia and the Greater Pacific. He also expanded the government to have a greater involvement in the Vietnam War and maintained close ties with the United States under the presidency of Lyndon B. Johnson. While visiting the White House, Harold stated the president's electoral tagline, All the way with LBJ. However, this was poorly received by Australians, bringing up the concern of Australia becoming America's lackey. I do understand that concern, but there is a lot to do with diplomacy and creating ties between countries for support that could be perceived that way. I don't know enough on it to actually comment, though. In his personal life, Harold was believed to be a bit of a playboy. Part of this came from when he started dating his eventual wife, Zara. It was around the time that she was going through divorce, so the belief was that they were having an affair and that he ended up fathering the twins that she had. Once widowed, Zara confirmed in her biography that Harold was a womanizer, and had multiple affairs that she knew of while married. But out of respect for the privacy of those women, she did not name them. Regarding Harold's health, because we are talking about an older man who did drown, prior to December 1967, Harold had been to the doctor regarding issues with his shoulder. He had been prescribed morphine and advised to rest the shoulder and not go swimming or play tennis, which were his two favourite sports. And prior to this, he had collapsed during Parliament. He had a heart attack, but put forward a story to the press saying that it was due to low iron, as he did not wish for people to start undermining his ability to lead. As it goes, Harold really was just your typical true blue Aussie bloke, which was both good and bad. But to keep us on track, the day in question went as follows. Harold started his day out by having breakfast and then calling his wife. She was due to follow him up in the following days with their family. He then drove to the corner store to buy snacks for the day and bought a copy of the paper. So fun fact with this, and I say fun fact more like a uh, macabre bit of interest. A newspaper called The Australian had released an issue that day with an article titled PM Told to Swim Less, which is very foreboding. Lots of foreshadowing within that statement alone. Harold returned home and made plans with his friends Marjorie Gillespie and her daughter Vina, Martin Simpson and Alan Stewart. They all drove down to Point and Peen, hoping to watch Alex Rose pass through the rip into Port Phillip with his yacht. However, where they were standing, it was barely visible. And as it was December, it was an extremely hot day. So they decided to move on rather than run the risk of getting heat stroke. On the drive back to Portsea, Harold suggested a stop at Cheviot Beach for a swim. Upon arrival, they noticed a high tide and choppy water conditions. Only Alan and Harold entered the water. Alan stayed towards the shore as he could feel an extremely strong undertow. 
Harold, however, did not hesitate and went deeper into the ocean. I don't know how ocean safety is taught around the world, but from a young age there were a few things that were taught to me, and I'm pretty sure almost every other Australian. And what was taught was to stay between the life-saving flags. That way, if there is someone on guard, they can come get you if something goes wrong. Another thing we were taught was be careful of undertows. If you can feel a strong current in the ocean, get out. It's not safe, it is a rip. If you get stuck in a rip, you will drown. I wasn't taught that you might drown. No, I was taught you will drown. But I digress. Marjorie watched from the shore and saw Harold disappear. At first she wasn't alarmed, assuming either a wave had crested or he had decided to dive. When questioned about it later, Marjorie was quoted saying, Like a leaf being taken out, it was just so quick. And just like that, Harold was gone, never to be seen again. Before we jump into theories, I do want to quickly discuss the beach in question. The army did have purchase of the beach, so it was being used for training. However, due to Harold being the Prime Minister of Australia, he was able to approach, take off his sunglasses and be like, hey, I'm the Prime Minister, let me and my friends on the beach. And the private at the gate let him in. That being said, it was only Harold and his friends on the beach at the time of his disappearance. The beach itself was named after the SS Cheviot, a ship that was wrecked on the underwater rock formations in 1878. There were no survivors from what I could find. During some of my research, I did also find out that the beach had been used for the initial outbreaks of tuberculosis, so it tended to be a hospice for the dying. During the rescue searches for Harold, the initial rescue boat sent into the waters capsized, leading to a secondary rescue boat being deployed to save the occupants of the first. If that doesn't tell you how dangerous the waters are, despite the fact that I did mention a giant ship that went down in 1887, then... Nothing will. As for the beach itself, it has since been made inaccessible due to the extreme danger of drowning or becoming injured if you do attempt to swim there. Although you can still visit the beach. That being said, you can't actually go onto the beach anymore, but you can visit and see the Harold Holt Memorial. Or if you want to see a different version of a memorial for him, we did open up a swimming centre for him, which is almost like a macabre Australian joke when you think about it. The most likely situation is that Harold got knocked over by a wave and drowned due to his injured shoulder and inability to get into a better position. He would have been caught in a rip and potentially lodged under a rock. The sea life then would have eventually eaten him and the currents would have taken what was left of his remains out towards the Arctic. But for fun, let's throw logic right out the window. Put on your tinfoil hat as we explore the theories of what happened to him. The first and one of the biggest theories that came up was that he was poisoned by Marjorie Gillespie. It was said that this happened because Harold would not leave his wife for her. The theories came from a rumour that her and Harold were having an affair. Now, this would explain why she didn't call out the moment Harold first went under. But how, you may be asking? How did she kill him? Well, theories suggest that she had slipped poison into something that he had consumed. But what household poisons could she have used? Rat poison, maybe? Drain cleaner? Those surely would have been tasted. Maybe she had a script for Valium or Oxycodone. And knowing that he had morphine, she knew this could cause side effects such as respiratory distress or death. Maybe she had a script for Valium or Oxycodone. And knowing he had to take morphine knew this could cause side effects such as respiratory distress or death. But knowing what medications did would require the knowledge. And it isn't like you could just Google this information during the 60s. Sure, there's a chance she spoke to a doctor and asked questions about what you could and could not mix it with. Marjorie always denied the claims of an affair and has explained their closeness comes from being good friends that lived next door to each other. Because... That's when good neighbours become good friends. If you get the joke, great. If not, we have a TV show called Neighbours. I'd say look it up, but it's a very corny soap opera. 
Marjorie Gillespie passed away on the 30th of October 2012, and it was until her dying breath that she did deny any of these claims. The fact is, murdering someone takes a lot of planning, especially if you're intending on doing it in a way that doesn't get you caught. The trip to Cheviot Beach was not planned, so if she did put something in his drink, or in his food, she would have had to have been sure that it would kill him, and that they wouldn't have been able to trace back what had happened. It doesn't sound like an overly strong theory to me. But that being said, who doesn't love a scorned woman? The next theory is suicide. It had been a rough year for Harold, both politically and personally. He was facing backlash for his pro-America stance involvement in the Vietnam War, political backlash regarding his financial decimals, he had that flare-up of his old shoulder injury, and recently had that heart attack. He was only 59 years old, but he was under the firm belief that he would not live to see 60. Due to all of that, it was believed that he may have decided to end his own life. The points I have for this being suicide are that Harold was a strong swimmer. He knew what Cheviot Beach was like as he had swam there previously multiple times. So he knew the dangers of that water. If you're really that determined, it's not that hard to go somewhere where you know it's dangerous and just let go. A pile up of stresses, both known and unknown, along with that firm belief of dying before 60 and deciding that that was the way that he was going to go. I can't talk for how other people come to the conclusion on suicide being their best option. That being said, I still feel like it's quite a flimsy list in the argument of points for. Points against was that Harold was a family man, and he was excited to spend Christmas with his grandchildren, and the children that he had adopted as his own. If you have family and you're that kind of person that's excited to see the children's faces light up when they are given their gifts, my goodness, you're not going to give up that chance, no matter what. Especially if it's just around the corner. Other points include the fact that the last time Harold went to Cheviot Beach, he went spearfishing. But he had to be rescued by his friends as he got knocked over by a wave. So, he, again, it just kind of points out the fact he's aware of how dangerous this beach is. He'd already required rescuing. And as Harold was known to have that typical Aussie bloke sportsman bravado that would cause him to throw caution to the wind, he very likely got told, yeah, you can't go swimming. But thought, nah, she'll be right. It's a statement that's thrown around so often, though. She'll be right. Unfortunately, this time, that wasn't the case. One of the bigger theories that have come up as well is the theory that he was actually a Chinese spy. For me, this theory doesn't hold a lot of water. Pun intended. The theory goes, Harold faked his death, boarded a Chinese submarine off the coast of Cheviot Beach, and lived the rest of his life in Beijing. The theory was so widely believed that a man by the name of Anthony Gray wrote a book that he claimed was a biography on the life and crimes of Harold Holt, called The Prime Minister Was a Spy. With a book title like The Prime Minister Was a Spy, I can honestly picture this. Participate with me if you can. If you're driving, please don't. Don't. Just don't. If you're doing something that requires your attention, don't. <laughs> I don't want to be part and parcel of anything that goes wrong here. However, if you can, I want you to picture this. You're in primary school, probably about nine or ten years old. You've walked into the Scholastic Book Fair, and there you can see it. A book with a hot pink cover, lime green writing that says, The Prime Minister Was a Spy. And the illustration on the front cover looks strikingly like anything done by Roald Dahl. Be honest, you can picture it, can't you? It sounds like a Roll Doll book. <laughs> but that being said, back to reality. That book was actually slammed so hard for inaccuracies. So how did this theory gain traction? Because he promoted greater engagement with Asia and the Greater Pacific. Shocker, right? <laughs> no records of a submarine being in the Cheviot area exist. And even then... The area is incompatible with submarines. But, as I said, we were throwing all forms of logic out the window. Make sure your tinfoil hat is on nice and tight. 
For argument's sake, let's say that they did dive off the shore, and Harold Holt swam out to it. He would have to swim a minimum of 50 kilometres off the shore, and then dive 300 metres down. Honestly, that is a big swim. Over 33 times the length of what an Olympic swimmer can swim. And without an oxygen tank, you can only dive 60 metres before you run the real risk of oxygen toxicity. Suffice to say, if he managed that swim, I'm also assuming that submarine had a screen door. Now, with the 1960s came assassinations. And there were quite a few of them that did happen. This includes the assassination of JFK in 1963. And closer to Harold's disappearance, both in time and geographically, was the attempted assassination of opposition leader Arthur Calwell in June of 66, when a 19-year-old student tried to shoot him while he was in the backseat of his car. So it really wouldn't be that big of a stretch to assume that it may have been an assassination. The only thing missing from that, though, is the bravado. Most assassinations on public figures tend to make a big splash. But this one, there was no person, there was no reason stated. Assassinations almost become a form of protest. Usually you know why, but this one, nothing. But again, tinfoil hat. But that being said, the stories that have come from this include divers dragging him to his death like a vengeful mermaid. The actual name for this, however, is Frogman, which was quite disappointing for me because I was kind of hoping for it to be kind of like a cryptid, half frog, half man, but it actually was instead tactically trained divers that would engage in forms of warfare. Others include time-delayed knockout drugs, but my question is how did they know that he was going there? Look, I, I, will, I will dive into a lot of these things after. But being murdered the day before and the witnesses were just actors. Because, yes, we've definitely heard of crisis actors. That is, um, that is a thing, apparently. The holes in these theories really do seem to stack up, though. Dangerous water conditions. As mentioned before, the first boat needed to be rescued. <laughs> so having someone under the water waiting to drag Harold to his death just doesn't seem to really doesn't really seem to fit how the water in that area acts. The next being, if it was a time-delayed drug, the question would be, how would they know that he was going to go to the beach and go swimming? This trip to Cheviot Beach was off the cuff. It wasn't planned. So either they didn't intend to kill him and they lost their mark, or they were desperately hoping that he would go swimming and drown, thus losing the body preventing a tox screen. The people on the beach being actors doesn't stack up either. Those people were genuinely in his life and they were not actors. And even then the sheer amount of power and pull you would need to be able to have to pull this off is immense. Like it, it sounds like it would be too much. It really does. Some of the outlandish theories that have come forward from this is aliens, merfolk, ocean-based bunyip, or that he swam away to start a new life on a small island with one of his mistresses. I have to wonder if any of you had the pleasure of watching Australian TV during the 90s. But there was a TV show called Round the Twist. It was a fantastically silly show. Great for a good laugh. Loved it. The idea of Harold swimming all the way to another island to live out the rest of his days reminds me of an episode from season 3 called The Whirling Dervish where the character Bronson accidentally swallows this fish and gets a whirly-willy, making it so he could power through the water like a speedboat. I, I don't know if I find the thought of an old grey man helicopter dicking through the ocean hilarious. <laughs> I'm going to be honest, I do. <laughs> or if I find the idea of the episode mildly disturbing now that I'm in my 30s. There's a lot to unpack there. A lot to unpack. If, if you've not seen Round the Twist or you have no idea what I'm doing, YouTube is your friend. Definitely give Round the Twist a watch. One of the reasons people believe this was a cover-up is because five days later, Harold was declared dead and John McEwen was sworn in as Prime Minister. One thing we do need to keep in mind is at this time, we were involved in the Vietnam War 
and we did not want to be seen as vulnerable without a leader. Now, not that I've been able to find this information while researching, but I was going through various Reddit threads and podcasts regarding Harold's disappearance, and one thing I found interesting, but was so sad that I couldn't find, was mentioned on a podcast called Weird Crap in Australia. So, shout out to them. They mentioned how there were psychic medium brothers that allegedly communicated with Harold's spirit. Now, with their Ouija board, Harold communicated with them, and according to him, he was knocked over by a wave and lodged under a rock shelf. One of the few times I've found that psychics entering in on a missing persons case didn't cause further issues. But that being said, that is all I have for you today. I hope you found this both informative and entertaining. If you have any theories that you didn't hear but you thought should have been on this episode, please don't be shy. Swing by and let me know on Instagram. You can find me at what you should know Australia. I post pictures relevant to the cases that I'm covering. If you have any recommendations or you just want to reach out and say hello, you can do so by sending an email to what you should know Australia at gmail.com. If you could do me a small favor, whatever platform you are listening on, please send me some love by liking, sharing, subscribing, whatever tickles your fancy. If you feel so inclined, you could also do all. It would really, really make my day. But until next Monday, stay safe and stay hydrated. Bye!